I'm going to be talking about Venice as a business operating city and as a city of fashion and as a global city. Um, and I'll show you in a minute why I call it global. And so these are sort of the three, the three topics. How Venice produced high fashion, displayed it, advertised it, and sold it throughout Europe and as far abroad as the Ottoman court in the city now called Istanbul, also in northern Italy um, and to some extent in North Africa. And this is the more practical issue, how the Venetian state controlled and promoted luxurious dress, and finally, how consumers of fashionable styles wore them to mark their status. And I'm going to be talking about black, white, and red, because those, <coughs> those are the great colors. Um, so this is a sort of simplified trade map um, of, the, of the region, the part of the world that Venice was busy in. And you see Venice up there at the, at the northwest. Constantinople was a constant trading zone um, for Venice. Aleppo um, was the kind of eastern, not the eastern limit, but a kind of eastern center of trade and exchanges. And silks of various kinds and, and dyes came from Ormuz in the Persian Gulf. So, so it's a big story. It's a big geography. Cesare Bacellio, who Tim mentioned, the costume book maker, in 1590 published um, two woodcuts of Italian merchants. And in fact, there are figures of merchants all the way through um, his book. But this is a Venetian merchant who would have run um, an elegant shop um, uh, in the in the the Frezzeria, which is one of the one of the regions for um, the kind of sections in the city where there are a whole lot of shops, and this um, this Italian merchant in Constantinople is an interesting figure uh, because that's where a lot of the trading went on, and men would go for years and years and years um, to set up as as businessmen and also to send goods back to Venice. So these are both kind of entrepreneurs, but but I would say that the the Franco means somebody who is freed to act on his own behalf in the city of Constantinople, although he's not an Ottoman, he's not, he's not a Muslim, as, as the city basically was defined. Merchants from Venice traveled throughout Europe, the Middle East, and Western Asia, and in the case of Marco Polo, as far as China. Cesare Vecellio was fascinated by the work of merchants, and at one point he, <laughs> he, he writes big compliments to two particular uh, Venetian booksellers uh, for reasons that may seem fairly clear because it, they, they both run um, elegant shops. One's their apothecaries actually, but um, kind of valuable books were sold as part of that business. So to some extent he's complimenting people he hopes <laughs> are going to move some of his books off the shelves. So we're just going to go back here. What I, th I want to say to you mainly about this nice little fresco is that cloth was king in Venice. There were, uh, textiles were a major um, part of the, of the industry of the city. And they were famous all over Europe. And this is, a, this is just a little kind of signal of, of what, what a draper's shop looked like in this period. It's a fresco. Um, and you see four <coughs> men at work. And the one on the far right is measuring cloth. Um, this is where you go to buy cloth. Uh, in large sways and sections. Yeah, this is, this is, I'm sorry to be hopping around like this. This is from the cover of a book um, by Giacomo Franco, a, an artist and braver um, and really kind of almost philosopher of, of, of Venice. And this is a book that he wrote about the abiti delle donne veneziane, the clothes that Venetian women wear. It was a very fine engraver, so it's a, it's a lot of fun to look at this book. And what's going on here um, is something that Eugenia Paolicelli has written about, and I think you're going to hear her um, in, in one of these sessions. Um, she shows that Venetians thought of their city as a world in itself. Franco gives us a globe to look at as though Venice itself you know, were the orb, were the entire the entire earth. And he says um, to a, a physicist to whom he was writing and sending a copy of the book, here I send you a drawing of the marvelous city of Venice in a round shape 
as a true portrait of the world. Venice is the world. Whoever looks attentively discovers the Arctic and the Antarctic poles at the same time, from which one can see the Levant and the West. So what he's doing is he's imagining the sections of Venice as the four continents. And here um, is Murano, this kind of, this kind of um, eastern part of the city. And he's thinking of that as Le the Levant, the east, the, the Near East, really, where a lot of products and textiles and so on came to Venice. He's thinking of this big section of, it's really, I think you could say, kind of the northwest section of Venice um, as Europe, right there, big in the middle. He's thinking of the lower uh, sections of the city as Africa to the south. And he's thinking of the Judaica at the west as America. Now, this is kind of a stretch. It's, it's, sort, of, it's sort of fanciful geography. Um, but the point that he's making um, is that Venice is at the center of networks of trading and culture. It makes visible the a myth that the Venetians shared. Their city was the center of world commerce in what it imported and especially in what it exported. This is a little vocabulary for, for where we're going. Um, and the, all of these uh, are makers of materials for clothing. So um, sumptuary, sumptuary law is interesting. We don't have an equivalent thing, but there were very strict codes of what people could wear in Venice. This is a Renaissance thing generally. You dressed according to your rank, and if you dressed above your rank, the fashion police would come and get you. <laughs> they really did. Um, so, so sumptuary law regulates what people are allowed to wear, what kind of festivals they're allowed to put on, the kinds of banquets, and so on. Now you've got two officials who tell you how politically important clothing was, I mean, both economically and in terms of um, kind of, what would you want to say, governing the population. The Proveditore alle Pompe oversaw things like processions, banquets, big public events. And the Proveditore alla Seta were silk guild members who kind of were, were the people who received complaints about um, <coughs> silk being made badly, about cheating in what was being sold, about uh, materials that were coming in illegally from other countries. So they were, they were sort of the silk police. And then of the Proveditore alla Seta, um, the Proveditore di Comune, and those were actually government officials who oversaw um, the silk trade <coughs> and had considerable powers um, at their disposal um, to punish people who were infringing the expectations. You could go to jail, um, all your products would be confiscated, you could even be banished. So this was, you know, this was, was enough of a, of a, sort of so central to the activities of the Venetian Republic that you had, you had people lined up on all sides um, with power to be sure that things were done according to the, according to, to the plans. I also have given you some names of um, people who worked in clothing. Tessitore was a weaver, Tintore was a dyer. Seteole were really silk entrepreneurs. entrepreneurs. They, they set up factories, they set up workshops, and bought and sold. The Felicaio made, it sort of dealt with furs. The Lutai was a velvet, make, a velvet maker. And the Merlataia, who I'll talk about at the end, were lace makers. So there were many specialized guilds in the city. They trained apprentices, supervised workshops, inspected and controlled the quality of their products, and displayed them at seasonal markets. One of these markets was the Sensa, a holiday, um, a religious holiday in the spring, celebrating um, the ascension of the Virgin Mary. Thousands of visits, I mean, thousands of uh, people came to visit the city for this week that the, that the festival went on to see the public display of goods made by Venetian craftsmen. Fabric makers, especially the owners of silk workshops, were required to set up stalls in the huge courtyard of San Marco so that buyers from Europe and also Asia and the Middle East could compare different fabrics and buy the best on offer. It wasn't, it wasn't up to you to decide whether you wanted to set up a booth. The booths had to be there so the customers could you know, say, OK, this, this is obviously better silk than this, um, and so on. Silk makers had to display their wares um, and <laughs> tolerate the kind of shopper who says, well, I'll come back. I'm not sure you know, that this is what I want. And the term um, for this kind of event was a parangone. Uh, and it really means a, a meeting where people can compare things. That specifically is, is what people were being invited to do. The best silk 
uh, the best textiles, and, and specifically silk, made uh, in Venice were called palangoni, the, the, what would you want to say, sort of, sort of the, the textiles that were comparable to the best. So the comparison meetings happened, and sometimes even often, uh, as often as once a week, if, if there was some suspicion that some kind of uh, uh, you know, illegal activity was going on among silk makers, you, you called them to the same, the same kind of meeting so you could check, um, you could check what was going on. And silk did need, definitely needed, to be inspected closely. Two kinds of fraud were condemned, and there were others, but these I think are fun. One was that a merchant would have a bolt of cloth rolled up and pull out about four feet of it. So that's what you looked at if you were buying it. But what was in the rest of the bolt was not good mm -hmm. cloth. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of, you know, um, you thought you were buying this beautiful tight woven velvet and in fact there was some sort of sort of scrabbly stuff, you know, waiting for you in the rest of the in the rest of the bolt. Another trick um, was that you you made a fairly mediocre wool, let's say, and you used a paste. You painted it on the surface so that the wool looked deeper and shinier, more lustrous. And then, of course, what happened was you had it made into a garment and it began to peel off and, um, you know, you saw what the trick was. The guild and the city government condemned both practices, but they continued, especially in the farther reaches of the public, um, on, on the mainland. I don't know if you've had the experience of, of reading a lot of laws um, and then reports about how they're not followed, but um, <laughs> Luca Mola has a wonderful study of, of silk um, in the Veneto, and, and there's just record after record of proclamations and then 98 court cases, and it's clear nobody has been listening to what they're supposed to do. Another issue in the city was how dyers colored their cloth. The most precious hues were reds. One, cremesino, was made from caramesh. This is sort of fascinating. The crushed bodies of tiny beetles living on wild grasses and bushes in the Caucasus, Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan. The second red dye, grana, was made of kermes that lived on oak trees in the Mediterranean, from Spain, North Africa, southern France, and Greece. And the first, the first kermes was more valuable, partly because it came from much further away, and the Mediterranean was pretty easy for Venice to negotiate in. They were sold, interestingly, um, some of the crimson fabrics. Um, and the crimson itself, the kermes, were, were brought by northern and, and western Europeans, for example, from Poland um, and Czechoslovakia, and they sold that kermes in markets in, in Venice. The international reputation of Venetian silk was a constant concern of the Republic. Setaioli, who sent inferior fabrics abroad were denounced as destroying the reputation and dignity of the Republic. They were fined, made to leave the guild, even banished. On the other hand, Venice had a protectionist policy for the benefit of silk makers. Incoming fabrics from other regions were met with high tariffs, this may sound like the 21st century, um, and smuggling them in led to fines and confiscations. Venetian velvets were international treasures. They had to be supported at their source. The Venetian government used silk textiles, especially velvets, as ambassadorial gifts, for example, when they traveled to the Ottoman Sultan in Constantinople and also to the Shah of Persia. You took these magnificent gowns with you um, and presented them um, to the emperor or the Shah. Uh, it was a kind of mark of, um, of the sort of sumptuous power of, of, of the city that, that could produce clothing like this. When royal visitors to Venice came from European courts, they were welcomed with extravagant ceremonies in which lavishly dressed Venetian citizens promenaded in the Palace of the Doge and in outdoor processions. The sumptuary laws, which I mentioned, were suspended on these occasions. You could, you could especially the women, could just put on everything they owned, you know, jewels and gold, um, satin, beautiful fabrics. So people, people could really Lay, lay on um, everything that they had of, of elegant uh, fashion. Men dressed in black velvet and women in white satin and all the jewelry they owned. They made up a living frieze of Venetian wealth and elegance. Really something to write home about. The state protected its cloth makers against competition from other regions of Italy, especially Genoa to the west and Lucca to the north. 
Many court records register threats of fines and even warfare from Venetian officials who've been alerted to the manufacture of goods such as dark black velvet by entrepreneurs who had stolen Venetian trade secrets or hired Venetian workers away from the city. Luca and Genoa were seen as especially lawless competitors. Pride in the city's goods was based on its clearly ranked types of cloth, parangone at the top, mezzane in the middle, and da navegar for things that were going to be sent abroad for export. Through the strict inspection by city officials of textiles made for purchase in the city itself and for other regions, Venice supported and celebrated its cloth makers and its tailors who designed new fashions. Though fashion changed more slowly in this era um, than it does now, very durable, expensive fabrics didn't wear out, and you sort of held on to them as long as you could. So let's look at how people at the top of the class ladder in Venice dressed. I'll just let you look at these, these people for a minute. They are uh, painted by Veronese. Livia da Porto Tiene with her daughter Deodama and her husband, Isepo da Porto, with Adriana, their son. I think this is an interesting pair of paintings, partly because um, they included their children. It's clear that they asked Veronese to paint the children as well, and I think partly to show that they could afford to dress their children as well as they dressed themselves. Mm -hmm. but one of the things that you may know or not is that children um, in the Renaissance dressed like little adults. There weren't special clothes for children, so I think that's, that's what you see um, in this picture. If we look at, um, if we look at uh, uh, Claudia, um, we see her wearing an overgown of rose-colored satin, satin you probably know is a kind of silk, lined with lynx fur. Her dress is wool dyed a newly stylish color, orange. Orange had not been, you know, in, in the dyer's vocabulary until the middle, the middle 16th century. So mm -hmm. arancia was a new and splendid color. And she's wearing or holding a tippet of sable or marten fur with a jeweled gold headpiece. You can see it over her arm. Let's look mm -hmm. at a few more of these. It's called a zibellino because zibello is, is, is like a little sable. Um, and they were made with the, the whole body uh, of the animal and then a, a, a metal head, a kind of lavish metal head which replaced the head that had, that had been on the actual animal. Um, here's, a, here's an example of a, a very elegant head that was made, jeweled, um, for Zibellino. Here's a really, uh, I would say, kind of weird and intriguing painting by Parmigianano of Antea. No one has been able to figure out exactly who she was. But you see her Zibellino. She's holding it with a glove. Mm -hmm. you see, and the little chain, but the head is still there. It hasn't been replaced by, by a jeweled metal head. And people think this one may be alive. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's uh, why else wear a glove? But, um, so so she's, a, she's a living example of how this thing works. And this is a northern, uh, kind of um, a woman from, from um, northern Italy, um, a painting by a wonderful portraitist, um, Giovanni Moroni, Isotto Brembati. She was, interestingly enough, a poet and a philosopher. But you see her zibellino around her shoulders. Mm. She's wearing it almost like a shawl. And up close, you can see, you can see the tippet, mm -hmm. you can see the head a little bit there. Actually, I talked about, I talked about these zibellini once at, a, at, a, at a, uh, a meeting where a woman came up afterwards and said, you know, that's just like the, those creepy little mink collars that our mothers <laughs> wore. Um, I, think these, I think these are actually more beautiful. They're very lavish. And it's not just a matter here of luxury, it's a matter of style. I mean, this I think is a real example of fashion. It's something that the Venetians invented and spread around, and it, was, it wasn't simply um, uh, a question of, of, of textile power, but of a, of a particular um, uh, quirky kind of style. Accessories go a long way to... Um, mm -hmm. Uh, to, to indicate really that you're that you're in the fashion world. So that this then is the husband, Giuseppe, and he's wearing black, and I'll come back to black as color, black satin lined with sable, and he's holding a sword with a golden pommel. So you have some really luxurious materials right there. The little boy wears a, sh a cape or a cloak lined with lynx fur. 
and he's dressed in velvet, and he too has a little sword. You see the pommel? Mm -hmm. That's right there. Okay. Now let's um, let's talk about lynx for a minute. The the sable is a small um, weasel-like animal, which is very common in northern Italy. It wasn't a rare bird, but lynx was uh, was something special. It came from um, Bohemia and and Czechoslovakia, countries mountainous countries um, in Eastern Europe. I'll show you one. Mm -hmm. um, this it, they called the Eurasian lynx. You can see why, but you see that white fur with a kind of brown overtone, and then the black spots that made it so extravagant and uh, and um, desired. And that's I just want to go back to the wonderful uh, this wonderful painting by Veronese, a nobleman wearing a huge indoor garment lined with lynx velvet velvet. Um, on the top and the lining with this of this amazing fur. <laughs> and this now, this is this is a painting that it would really be much better to be able to put your nose up to it. But black was a uh, was a hard color to make. It was it was hard to make a rich, long lasting dye of black. It faded. Um, the salt air of Venice was a difficulty. Uh, so People worked very hard at making beautiful blacks, and this was something that the Genovese and the Lucchese were very good at. Black, the black dye was made of um, oak galls, you know, the uh, kind of like round, sort of paper-like um, little circular things that grow on oak trees. Those were very, very, very dark brown if you stewed them and mm -hmm. fermented them. And then red, the, the very dark, um, rich red, which I'll, I'll be coming to later, and then blue from indigo. You had to layer up these dyes to get a black that really held on. Uh, Cesare Vecellio wrote um, about black as a dignified color that uh, the, the officials of the city wore. Um, and it, it gave a kind of maturity and um, uh, wisdom, really, to the men who wore it. And everybody did. I mean, doctors did, uh, <laughs> apothecaries, merchants did, and a lot of the officials of the republic, the members of the bureaucracy. So the interesting thing about this painting is how many different kinds of black fabric he's wearing. He's holding a velvet beret with a little bit of um, <coughs> uh, silk fringe. You can see his, his black satin uh, doublet and a kind of mysterious um, sort of toga-like piece of, piece of cloth, you know, kind of going diagonally, curving across. He's wearing big um, breeches slashed that, that with can't see that too clearly, but with vertical slashes, which really show a satin, a black satin lining. And people, uh, the rich could afford to just slice, you know, great horizontal, dramatic um, holes in their clothing. So that was a, that was a high fashion sort of thing. So it's extremely understated, but it's extremely rich and elegant. And uh, Venetians really developed an eye for blacks. They were surrounded by them. They were an important um, kind of uh, color, so that's the that's the story of black. Now let's go to white. White satin was a specialty um, of the city. I don't know if I mentioned that in these processions, um, women uh, promenaded in, in white silk. Satin is a is a very smooth silk, um, and this is may possibly be the daughter um, of Titian, Lavinia. There are a lot of interesting details here, but she's wearing she's wearing a white satin dress. Pearls were another to be to wear pearls and be blonde was to look like a true Venetian, a stylish Venetian. And she's carrying a little paper uh, paper fan called the ventolino, which was um, uh, also a kind of specifically Venetian fashion item. They're, they're, they're paper, and sometimes they're they're embroidered or they're painted with gilt or scenes from daily life. So there's an extremely fashionable daughter of, uh, of a very prosperous painter. This is uh, another painting by Veronese of, uh, it's a religious subject, but what's so interesting is that St. Agnes is wearing a very striking white satin uh, to drapery with gold, gold woven into it, a brocade. And what strikes me as interesting about this is, I'm showing you a detail, is if you if you look closely, this is not stitched and cut. It's tied on with a green cord. 
So what this suggests to me is that, um, that uh, Veronese had a swatch of this cloth in his studio, which he used for various purposes. It looks gorgeous, but she wasn't going to walk off in a dress like that. Mm -hmm. it, was a, it was a way of kind of folding and displaying um, mm -hmm. uh, a white satin fabric. <coughs> this is, I'm sorry, it's not a good slide. This is in a private collection, and, and there seems to be only one not very good photo of it. But it's the allegory of Venice with the Virgin. And I'm very struck by this, because she is a typical Venetian beauty. In fact, she looks like a, like a Dogaressa, the, the wife of the, of the Doge, the prince. She has a little, a little kind of cardinal, a little hat, like his. Pearls decorate her hair. It's complicated with coiffure, white satin with gold embroidery, a gold brocade cape, um, and she's blonde. That's, that's the look. Um, and the, and the, it's not surprising that, that a figure who symbolizes, who allegorizes the city would be presented in this way. It's Venezia um, with the Virgin Mary. Now, um, we looked at some black, we looked at some white. Red was the really big color in Venice. It was, it was what, it, red velvet was what Venice was really famous for. And it was made in a fairly complicated way. There were two sources of it. One, they're both from, I've mentioned, the, the Kermes. Some, some of it came from um, Eastern Europe, some of it came from um, the, uh, the Mediterranean. And it's a glorious color. I mean, it, it took, whether you're making crimson or um, grana, as it was called, it was a, grana was a slightly, a slightly uh, orange or red. Whether you were using either, or, or aiming for either of those colors, you had to layer up different dyes. Again, you dipped the dye, you, dip, you dipped uh, uh, a crimson uh, fabric into dye, you took it out, you dipped it again, you dipped it into a third, so that you're, they were going for very rich, um, very impressive colors. And there was a third source of red, and that was cochineal from the New World. Cochineal is made of, of, of beetles um, that live on the nopal cactus plant. And the Spanish, when they got to the New World, saw that this made a fantastic dye, so the Venetians uh, cashed in on it too. And, and this particular family, the Cucina family, started and in fact won a monopoly on, on cochineal in Venice, which meant they were the only ones who could sell it. So you can see that that's a very wealthy and prosperous family. Um, and, the, and the painter, Veronese, the painting's enormous. It's, it's about six feet. By, do I have the measurements for yeah. you? Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's a huge thing. And it's a line up all the members of that family. Um, and they're dressed in various kinds of red. There's red wool. Um, the, the sort of mistress of the household is wearing red velvet. Um, and you also have some white satin in the, in, the, in the figure who represents the church, who's kind of presenting this family um, uh, to, the, to the Virgin. All those reds made the Cucina one of the wealthiest families in Venice. There's a close-up. Um, Zuana uh, di Muti was the, was the person in this household who acquired um, the monopoly. No one could, no one, no one could sell these, these red textiles um, except her family. And this was the num <laughs> primo numero uno fabric from Venice. Dark, richly dyed crimson velvet, which is called alto basso, high and low. And the reason for that is that velvet is made, it's, it consists of little, little loops of silk. And if you're doing just a flat velvet, those loops are cut, they're sheared, all in the same, uh, all at the same level. But alto basso, which is also called um, uh, pile velvet, mm -hmm. was made with their little loops, and then next to them there are larger loops, so that the little loops recede and what you're seeing here is, is the dark lower level of the velvet and then the, the higher um, the higher loops produce this this surface kind of standing and if you look at these velvets it's like looking into the into a sea of red it, it's it, and it, of course they feel wonderful too but that's a technique that the Venetians made famous and this particular you see they're really there are two bolts or there are two there are two sections or panels of velvet here they were sewn together to make garments for the officials of the city. That's a close-up. What, what you see really is a crown and a kind of loop underneath it, and then a flower. People call that a carnation of 
pattern. I think it looks like a rose. But. So this is what the officials of the Republic wore. And, and uh, Jacopo Robusti is AKA uh, Tintoretto, painted a lot of these, of these officials. And this one um, is Jacopo Soranzo, uh, the procurator, uh, the, the proc well, the procurators were procurators, were basically tax collectors. They were very, very powerful in the, in the uh, Venetian uh, bureaucracy. And you can see what he's wearing. He's wearing that, exactly that kind of velvet, the same pattern with the, the carnation and loops um, lined with white fur. That's the way you dressed if you were a procurator. And it's actually sort of funny, I don't want to keep you too long, but, but you had to pay for your own red velvet you know, outfit. Mm -hmm. And some, some Venetian patrician said, I don't want to be a procurator. I can't, we don't have the money in the household to pay for this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But it meant that, it certainly meant if you, were, if you were dressed in velvet like this, that you were an official um, of, of an important rank in the city. This is a, a, a single ply um, piece of alto basso velvet worn as a stole. If you were, if that was a mark of, of that particular kind of, um, that particular kind of, of office. So now I'm going to white and Venice, and I, I mean <coughs> lace. Lace was the other thing for which Venice was really, really famous. And I'm not now talking about power actually so much as powerlessness. This is a not very good painting, but you can see this very fine, pointy, um, perforated looking kind of lace that was, uh, that was typical of the city. This is uh, Franco again, the person whose globe we looked at. And it's a wonderful um, engraving. You can see her ruff. She's wearing a lace ruff. Um, her cuffs are made of lace. And she's got a kind of lining for her bodice, which is, which is this kind of lace. The, 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 the pattern, the style is called pizzi. They're little pointed um, uh, parts of trim. Um, it was never a smooth outline. It, it always was to have these wonderful points. This is as good as it got. This is Venetian needle lace. It was made. Uh, it was made all all by hand. In other words, every 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 design was made by a woman using a needle. And uh, and you see wonderful kind of delicate connections between. This is vastly blown up, but punto in aria, it was called, stitch in the air, and it's it was it was the real um, luxury uh, substance or or fabric among the lace makers. Here are three more examples. Um, you see the pizzi, the, the kind of pointed um, uh, design, and there were also borders of it. And this would have been um, probably a collar um, worn for a. Now, who made this lace? The lace was made by women working in nunneries, shelters, and um, convents, convents, and also in, 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 their, in private houses on the islands, not in the center. And these women had very little control over their product. They didn't belong to a guild, so nobody was looking out for them, you know, protecting their prices, keeping them competitive. They were completely dependent on the organization of the, of the institution. What normally happened was that um, they worked as many as seven, eight hours a day making lace. And when the lace was sold, the, they got a third of the price. And that they had to divide in, into two thirds went to the convent, for example, and one third went to their sort of private account. To maybe make a dowry or something later on. So this is really, I don't want to say slave labor, but, but very, very grim um, and hard. And uh, there's a woman, a, a historian, who studied this uh, for a long time, and she sums it up this way. This is Anna Molfino. In the documentary sources of the second half of the 1600s, the organization of lace making appears as a vast underground sector of the economy with tens of thousands of workers at home, in poor houses and city shelters, in dark, damp sheds in the countryside, with no control whatsoever over their industry, forced into overwork directly by merchants and itinerant mercers, the people who sold trims of various kinds and um, didn't belong <coughs> in the city particularly. So I think when, when we look at these beautiful things, and the things that were made of them, I'll show you a few more, they're a sort of puzzling fashion. 
poor, day-long, challenging labor by women who literally weren't visible in the city, and yet it's so beautiful. They made lace for people who could afford it. They, they would never have been able to afford it. So I just want to end here with, with some, um, some examples of how people wore lace. This is Alessandro Farnese. And so it isn't just women who wore, who wore lace. This is a terrific lace collar. There are actually three layers to it. And you see those characteristic points that the needlewomen of the city made. This is a Spanish noblewoman with, you can see how, how sort of um, airy this lace is. Um, sometimes it was dyed yellow or gray or blue, um, but this I think is, is uh, a real sort of Spanish luxury lace. I'm coming to the end. This is a, a painting by an English uh, portraitist made, made in the early 17th century, <coughs> and she, her headdress is full of lace, and again, this is the sort of needle lace with the pizzi that was uh, a specialty in Venice. And even queens wore it. <laughs> There's Maria de' Medici in a spectacular lace collar. So where am I going with all of this? What does this add up to? Um, luxurious fabrics, strict state control of how they were made and sold, and uh, uh, sources of textile specialties that went all the way up and down the social scale. <coughs> Cloth was king in Venice, and so we've seen some of the kinds there were, and I hope I've given you some idea of how the, how the people who made these fabrics um, worked. So I hope this trip through the merchandise of 16th century Venice, as it was promoted, manufactured, advertised, and displayed, will link up with some of the processes. You may see some uh, some links uh, with today's Italian design. We, there weren't individual designers um, in Venice in the 16th century, but there were famous tailors. Um, families, er, aristocratic patrician families, would fight over over you know who got the, who got the next garment from from a from a famous tailor. So he wasn't he wasn't working on an industrial level, but but there's something like handmade um, luxurious. Uh, clothing that you can recognize as coming from, um, from a particular designer and maker. Individual named designers were not yet in the picture, but very good tales were much in demand. And though buyers did not buy garments with labels saying made in Venice all around the world, people recognized Venetian satins and velvets, furs and lace as the product of a brilliantly inventive and wealthy city. That's a good question because <coughs> silk, um, the, the threads of silk that are that are taken out of off cocoons and spun are white. Um, but to to make a good clear white, um, you you sometimes used a little bit of blue. You had to keep it out of the sun. It was very lustrous, but it but it, it was worn much more inside than outside. Um, the lace actually is made of linen, and that sometimes was bleached pretty fiercely um, mm. to make it white. But a uh, white satin, it was a, I, I guess the best way to explain it would, is that it's a delicate color. So that even wearing it um, is, is <laughs> a little more risky than, than wearing red or, or black. It's more of a, it needs protection. Um, so I think you're quite right to wonder, you know, how is it, how is it done, how is it made? Were blue and green in the picture? Um, they were, blue was indigo, but, but there was a very famous Venetian color called Paonazzo, which means the colors of a peacock, and that was made of blue, which was um, dyed in a bath uh, with red, and you got this very rich, um, it's a kind of blue, it's a sort of, sort of purplish, very bright purplish blue, and that was, that was worn by Venetian officials, it was a very prestigious color. And then there was the blue that came from indigo and, um, and from other plants such as woad, and that made it, that but a combination that would make a good blue, but um, not, not as bright as pure indigo. 
And one more, <laughs> one more source of fabric colors was um, trees uh, in, the, in the east that produced sap. It was called lac, so like lacquer. And a blue, a really good blue might have some of that in it because it sort of fixed and deepened the color of blue. Blue green, um, that was that was that was okay. I haven't seen it in portraits of, of very wealthy Venetians, but a color that was very it was called turchino, which is the Turkish color, um, and that was a kind of blue green sort of light blue green. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, because from the talk, it's you, there's like hints to connections, global connections. Mm -hmm. You mentioned global, Venice is a global city, no? So I see this uh, map, global map, that goes from the Cochineo, right, the red from mm -hmm. Mexico, mm -hmm. uh, to Venice, mm -hmm. and then to this um, Spanish Empire colonies and trade, and that might be to Asia. Mm -hmm. right? So there's this global trade mm -hmm. uh, going on. So I, I wanted to know if you could tell us a bit more about how Venice was a global city. And because it's a term that's very contemporary. Yes, I know, I know. And everybody uses it now, and what do they really mean by it? I just want to go back to the trade map. Uh -huh. I was going to take a minute, but... Yeah. If I may add to mm -hmm. this question. What were the competitors right, yeah, of Venice? Is that, that the, the, the other global city? <laughs> well, one of the one of the big uh, across across you know far away competitors was um, Turkey. Was the Ottomans? They made terrific velvet. They made beautiful satin. And what happened that was that the things were shipped back and forth. And some of the designs of velvet uh, curators can't tell whether they're whether they're Turkish or Venetian. Um, for example, the the high low velvet that I showed you. So so there was a, there was there was rough competition. And the funny thing was that even when there were um, battles in which the Christian Venetians confronted um, the Muslim Turks, Venice quietly carried on its business with with um, with the Ottoman Republic. Um, they found land routes if there were naval battles. Um, they made they made negotiations. They actually sometimes had went went through North Africa um, to make that kind of connection. So so the export um, was was certainly global, and the city itself. I mean, if you see if you see kind of street paintings of Venice in the 16th century, the 17th century, there are people in turbans. There are people in high fur Russian hats. Um, uh, there are there are. I'm trying to think that there, there are Germans in their huge, pouchy um, um, breeches. So there's a whole, I mean, it was, it was, a, it was a city that was friendly um, to foreigners because they were needed um, and also pretty cautious about them. I mean, this whole business about export, import, and the duties that were put on things coming from the outside. But it was a wonderfully cosmopolitan city. I mean, that's, that's, that's the best thing to say about it. Um, Jews were um, welcomed in Venice. They were doctors. Um, they were they were um, professionals of various kinds, um, and they they made money in fabric. Um, the, the cloth merchant was it was a figure you see a lot in, in um, costume books. Uh, so so I mean you could see you make it simple and say Venice is on all these waterways, and that's that's an important part of it. But it was a it was a it was a society that that was business oriented from the beginning. You know that that um, feudal societies, the, the aristocracy makes its money from land. They own land. Uh, peasants work on the land, and they um, you know they, they bring their products. And, so so it's a, it's a <coughs> land based. You know, but you know, but this was never the case in Venice. Um, the international business was how the patriciate, how the I guess we could call them the nobility made their money and they'd been doing it since the year 1200. So there was no, there was no association of um, trade with the middle classes or the less than noble classes. Um, people had been, had been involved in this kind of trade since, since the beginning of the Republic. Really. So it's, it's, partly a, it's partly a geographical phenomenon. It's partly, I guess you could say, a kind of cultural political phenomenon. Um, and 
I mean, certainly, beautiful fabric, fabric came from the, from the markets in Aleppo and Damascus um, and further and further, further east. But I think you could really say that the trade was the principle of Venice. And that explains the population and the wealth in some ways. Um, <laughs> Self-interest that kept Venice from going to war um, and, and losing prosperity and security in the city. Yeah, here, I, I saw that hand back there first. What is, for example, very like, you talk a lot about like upper class people, like, what is like non poor people or like non white people? Um, yeah, the, the, it's a good question, and, and you, it's a good point to make because I've been showing you the luxury, um, the luxury yeah. items. Well, mm -hmm. what, what do you I actually Middle think modern period or, right, is it, it was a particular is it in this period. Well, the the what I've really been talking about most of the time is luxury. You know, fabrics that were expensive to make, um, lace that was really um, laborious um, and and demanding to make, um, silks of various kinds, and those were not worn by people of the middling sort, who were more likely to wear wool. Um, maybe with velvet trim. Um, I should say also that men dressed as luxuriously as women. You probably saw that from, from the images. And, and people, people in, the, in the peasant class dressed in linen and wool. I mean, it could be very fine wool, but, but um, sort of cheap, rough wool. And everybody wore a chemise, which was made of linen. It was kind of an undershirt, you know, a long linen undershirt. And sometimes very poor people had only that. Um, so the question, the question about fashion, I think there's some very interesting work that's been done on this. That that people of of the middling sort and even um, a kind of wealthy peasant would quite likely buy items uh, made of a made of velvet or gilt or you know some some fancy trim and wear them with much much simpler clothes. But they were looking to see um, what they could get that would give them a little bit of that of that glamour. And a lot of clothes circulated in the secondhand clothes market. I mean, uh, the, the, that was a very big um, kind of exchange. And so fashionable bits moved around. They weren't, they weren't successfully reserved um, for, the, for the upper class. Mm -hmm. um, you were asking something a little different, I think. What, what's the, I mean, you wanted to know what people, not the non-patricians wore. The difference between luxury and fashion, I mean, it's just a really, it's a really deep question. I mean, I would say that fashion is new. Fashion is noticeable for being new. <coughs> like the little paper fan, I mean, that, that sort of came into visibility in the middle 16th century. And then, and then they became even more fashionable. They had the little maps on them and the little sayings and so on. Um, and you still see those paper fans in, uh, fans in, paper, uh, in paintings of the 18th century. Mm -hmm. But that's a novelty. And I associate fashion Something that something that people haven't seen before, and the same thing with the with the Tibenino, you know, the, the, the sable with its with its golden skull. Does that sort of make sense? And our fashion, of course, is it moves so much faster. I mean, <laughs> what's on what's on in the fall is not on in the in the next fall. It's, it's determined by change and the desire for um, something new. Because of course, that means people have to buy um, new new clothes. Um, it moved much more slowly in the in the in the Renaissance, but um, I think I think I would call fashion something that's invented, even if it even if it invented in the sense of something that's designed to be different from what's preceded it, and then it gets trademarked, let's say, as the new show. Um, the the luxury is something else. I mean, it, it, it's you could you could say it's textile before it's clothing, and that's that's a good deal of what I've been showing you. But you don't. <laughs> You don't sort of stuff a Martin and throw it over your shoulder. You know, it's that that particular substance is um, is channeled into a noticeable garment that has that has prestige and you know a local identity attached to it. Does that clear it up a little bit? Yeah. yeah. In a detail of one of the paintings, did I see fingernail polish? Somebody had like, glitter on their fingernails. 
one of the one of the portraits. <laughs> Yellow when you see it, not there. I mean, I uh, courtesans and prostitutes did paint their nails. Um, I'm not sure whether noblemen did, <laughs> or it's possible that the, that they did, but not for a, a kind of official portrait. Um, no, there was a lot of cosmetic. Uh, uh, ingenuity um, in Venice, so I wouldn't. It wouldn't be. I just, I just can't. Can you remember anything else about the portrait? Um, it might be someone who's holding a a zibellino. Uh, no. No. Sorry. I, 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 we'll we'll find it right. here. I just want to see if anyone else has a has a general question. Yeah. I'm struck by how hot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Lace isn't hot, but what people wore was light silks. They're very light silks. They're silks that are almost transparent. Um, so, in fact, Michelle is very interesting because they'll give you, they'll give you a print, a woodcut of a man, a nobleman in the winter wearing heavy dark robes, and then you'll see it in the summer. And it's, it's, it's more, it's more about lace and um, light, light satins and so on. So, but the other thing is cold in Venice. <laughs> Venice is a really cold city mm. because of being on, you know, on 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 the lagoon um, and uh, the sea. Uh, so I would, I mean, I haven't lived. Well, I've lived in Venice a lot, and and, and it's uh, it's cold <coughs> from at least from September to even sometimes June. So a lot of those velvets and furs were serving a practical purpose. Mm. I was struck when you were talking by the way that the painterly problem of finding the right pigments and colors mm -hmm. to represent the clothes mm -hmm. whose dye is itself an interesting technical mm -hmm. and perhaps personally mm -hmm. problem um, seemed interesting and, and meta. And for us, at least, the practice of the painter codes as art and the mm -hmm. practice of the dyer codes mm -hmm. as craft. Mm -hmm. And I would think also painting lace would be particularly painstaking just mm -hmm. like A lot, a lot. Um, one of the really interesting things about the painters is that they were often related, or they, or they, they were in the same family as cloth makers. Um, I'm trying to think. Um, Veronese had a cousin who was um, uh, an embroiderer, you know, who, who needleworked, you know, luxurious cloths. And they also used some of the same substances. Lap, which I was talking about, this the kind of this kind of red dye, it really was like shellac. And so that's what painters used. Mm -hmm. um, there's a wonderful recent book about <coughs> paintings, and there are two analyses of paintings, and the number of substances that are the same is fascinating. Um, yellows were made um, with um, what's the there's a there's an herb fustet, um, and that that you use in in both a yellow dye, you know, and and on a canvas, mm -hmm. so that there was a lot of um, you know shared shared substance skill um, between these two. And you know, if you look at the lace, I mean, some of the lace has, has intricate little pictures in it, you know, so that, so it's the sense that, I mean, the, the gills were called arte, you know, the, the, the arte de, de, la, de la seta. And so, I mean, it, it means a guild, it means a craft, but it's also the word for art. Mm -hmm. So that's a really, there was a lot of um, interconnection. So nobody wants to ask about those poor nuns <laughs> propping up the economy but not getting anything much back from it. Yeah. I, I'll, I'll, I'll go there. I'll, <laughs> so, you know, I think of, I guess especially like 17th century Venice and monastic life, and I think about forced monasticism, and I think about like, you know, various writers who were talking about like that aspect of religious life, do you see any relationship between that practice and the kind of like forced labor of religious women? What is it called? A forced claustration. A lot of, um, most of the most of the young women in Congress, um were from wealthy families that couldn't afford dowries. Um, and who is it? Um, uh, um, who's the, I know, I think the, yeah. Tarabotti, that's right, that's what I'm trying to um, She was locked up um, right. at the age of 16 or 17 and wrote a really powerful um, 
uh, I guess, polemics um, objected to this this process of, of you know sort of locking locking up girls who had no religious application at all. Um, and she, in fact, has says in in one of her angry texts, the worldly girl. The, one, the woman in the family is being married off, has beautiful clothes, lays silks from all around the world, and so on. All I have, all somebody, in fact, I think she, she speaks in the first person, have is clumsy clogs, um, you know, rough wool, raggedy dress, um, and, and a, a collar, so I think she says so ugly that it hides any charm that nature might have given me. So, so she, I mean, there is, there certainly is a awareness of, um, and, it, and it's and it's it's labor without reward, without protection. I don't know how you could make lace for seven or eight hours a day. Mm. Um, but there was also an idea was that that for some of these women, um, they needed to be taught virtue and patience. So there was a, a kind of moral or pious um, justification for that kind of work. Do you think there's any relationship in a sort of like? I guess what I'm saying is, did these two different things develop completely independently of each other? Um, women like Karaboti being forced into the convent and then nuns being forced to do this drudgery that no one else wanted to do. Um, was this, were these two phenomena that developed completely independent of each other and then turned out to be a perfect match for each other? Or was this a sort of thing where someone was like, huh, lots of cheap labor and like, does this, am I making any sense? No, you are making sense. And it, I think in the beginning, this is what's so interesting, is that noble women, and one was the wife of a doge, said um, they made lace themselves. You know, it was a lady's occupation. It was kind of, um, and, and one of them opened um, what you could think of as sort of school for lace. And then it became clear, it became, uh, you know, a, a kind of more commercial light um, was shown on this, and, and it was clear that, that this is something that, that Nuns. And I mean, some of these were women, you know, who, who had been abandoned by their husbands. I mean, there were different sorts of institutions. But um, I think the idea that they could do this started in the kind of